Okay, so today we will start on uh, the MHC class 1 pathway. Um, in the previous class we had uh, studied uh, the MHC, the discovery about MHC and MHC products which are important uh, in so many different uh, immune uh, uh, reactions. Um, and so, uh, if we look at what are the some of the key features of uh, the MHC, the first is MHC molecules bind and uh, present peptides to T cells. And what uh, the peptide binding does is actually it stabilizes cell surface MHC. So, if you have MHC molecules in the absence of uh, uh, peptides, these are unstable. So, that is a very important point that students ought to remember. The second thing is genetic localization, M the MHC class 1, class 2 molecules are encoded in the major histocompatibility uh, uh, locus and uh, this is known as H2 in mouse and HLA in humans. Um, and this is a particular defined localization. Now, what is important to remember is that apart from MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules, there are other components of MHC as well as uh, non-immune components that are part of this, um, of this complex. And we will be looking into that a little bit more in this class and also in the subsequent class. Uh, the third important point is that they are interferon gamma inducible or cytokine inducible. Um, so, why should this be? So, the moment you have an immune reaction to you want to amplify uh, these and, and part of uh, way to amplify is the use of inflammatory cytokines. So, interferon gamma is a good example of, inf uh, of, uh, of this and what interferon gamma does it will result in more expression of MHC class 1, class 2. So, what how does this help? Because you have more MHC class 1 and class 2 then the chances of a particular uh, antigen specific or pathogen encoded peptide that is recognized by T cells is high is also higher. So, consequently your chances for a immune reaction or, or generation of the immune response is also more. So, that is something that, uh, um, that again you should be sort of familiar with. Uh, the other aspect is um, that uh, MHC molecules are polygenic that means there are several genes encoding. So, for example, in humans you have MHC class 1 that is encoded by um, A, B and C. Um, and, and in uh, MHC class 2 human ones are DP, DQ, DR. So, there are these different genes um, that are encoding um, MHC class 1 or MHC class 2 molecules. Um, the other point is that, uh, that they are polymorphic. So, within K, within uh, let us say A, B, C you have different forms of HLA A so, um, or HLA B. So, you have HLA B 5 HLA B 27 so on. Um, and so, it results in uh, you know in polymorphisms and so what is the importance of polymorphisms? What polymorphisms allow is for different um, because there are the polymorphism the polymorphic residues are usually present in the peptide binding region. Um, you will have the, the array of peptides that can bind to MHC molecules is increased. Um, so, that is an important point that uh, um, students should be familiar with and this is uh, part of uh, some of the key features of MHC molecules. And this is we will just briefly go over the structure of uh, MHC uh, molecules. Uh, um, so, MHC class 1 molecules you have a heavy chain and the heavy chain has two dom has three domains the alpha 1, alpha 2 and the alpha 3. Now, if you can see the peptide binding uh, uh, groove is consists of the alpha 1 and alpha 2 domains. And so, therefore, the, 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 the polymorphisms that are responsible uh, for binding different peptides will be localized primarily in this peptide binding groove region. The alpha 3 is important for binding to beta 2 microglobulin. Um, now, um, in MHC class 2 molecules there are two chains that is the alpha and the beta chains and you can see the peptide binding uh, groove is consists of, uh, of uh, uh, the alpha as well as the beta uh, chains. So, what happens? So, MHC molecules present peptide to T cells. So, what is the consequence of this? So, this is what is shown over here. This is the antigen presenting cell. It is presenting a MHC peptide complex uh, to a T cell and you have a cognate TCR MHC reaction. Uh, by cognate what I mean is you have a specific reaction. That means, this TCR is specific for this MHC peptide. And so, once you once you have this and there are other features also involved in this, but mainly the specific interaction comes from the binding of the TCR to the MHC peptide uh, complex. Once you have this, so the T cell gets activated, it produces IL-2, it produces other cytokines and IL-2 is important because it, uh, it allows for growth of these cells. So, you will have this clonal uh, T cell that will now, uh, uh, now you will have more numbers of these of the same cells. So, in order for that you need growth factors and IL-2 is a T cell autocrine growth factor. 
So, the T cells proliferate and in case of um, uh, CD8 what will happen is this cognate interaction will result in differentiation from a CD8 to a CTL and as, um, so, so CD8 positive uh, um, uh, T lymphocyte becomes a cytotoxic T lymphocyte by process of differentiation and it is the CTL which can now kill um, the uh, target cells containing um, uh, MHC peptide complexes. So, this is a very important um, uh, uh, po uh, uh, point that students should be very familiar with. What is the job of the MHC molecules is to present peptides and where are these peptides generated? These peptides are generated within this particular uh, antigen presenting cell. Once, so, um, so, whatever is happening inside the cell, the T cells can peruse it or you know get a feel for what is happening and the T cell over here will recognize this um, using uh, the specific T cell receptor. Once you have this, you have T cell activation. Okay, now that you um, uh, you have uh, you have you have done some uh, you have some knowledge about MHC molecules. We will be trying and doing some experiments to to better understand this process. So let's say um, so you have said you have antigen presenting cell and you have a T cell. So we'll we'll have what we have what I've shown over here is um, antigen presenting cells from different mice with the haplotypes. Uh, by haplotypes what I mean is their, their um, MHC molecules are, are, are different. So, that is it is shown as F here, D here, B here and uh, this is a this is a F1 which is a D by B. Now, um, the APCs will present antigen in, in complex with uh, the MHC, but it needs to be recognized for that we need specific uh, T cell clones. So, you have a T cell clone here. So, this particular T cell clone is recognizes the antigen or peptide in complex with I A of D. Now, if you remember I A, I A is a MHC class 1 uh, is a MHC class 2 molecule and D again refers to the haplotype. This is another T cell clone, this recognizes um, the antigen in complex with I A of B. Right. So, these, these differences are due to polymorphisms and they are, they are very distinct. Um, so, now if when you put the APC and the T cell together, um, you should get IL-2 production uh, if it is a cognate reaction. So, we will address whether there is a, 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 um, a whether you will get IL-2 production or um, um, some indicator of a response a bit of for a cognate interaction between the TCR and the MHC. So, do you think the T cell clone that is specific for this haplotype will recognize um, APC in um, a, a, and you have to remember in these experiments and the antigenic protein is given. Um, so, it will not recognize because it is the MHC is, is, is different, um, but if it is a different um, APC and the antigen is given and if you have this particular I of D and the D then it recognizes. Now, again with B it will not recognize, this one this clone will not recognize, but, but this clone will because it is IA of B over here. Um, now, uh, now, the APC which is the F1 which has a D and B um, uh, will uh, generate a response in both the clones because it expresses one allele of D and one allele of B. So, what does this refer to? This refers to codominant. Okay, this is the phenomenon of codominant, and that is because we have one set of chromosomes from a father, one set of chromosomes from a mother. So we are 2n. So that's why that's why um, both types of MHC molecules will be expressed on the APC. So as a, as a as a result of this, you will get uh, this APC molecule will be able to present both uh, the antigen in both in the D as well as the B. So this is a very important concept, and I hope students understand this very well. Okay, now, we will try and go to a, to a second experiment. The reason why I show these experiments is because um, you know by experiments you can really test your learning um, and I think it is a good way to learn and so that is why and it is also a little bit of fun also because you know instead of just, uh, just me telling you all the facts it is important for you to understand the experiments that go on. So, um, over here we have these um, um, APCs uh, with antigen and then you have this particular T cell. Now, what has been done here is you have an antibody molecule against uh, IA of D and you can see at the control antibody which does not recognize the particular MHC molecules, you will see IL-2 production um, if, uh, if that is the readout, whereas if you have an antibody that blocks IA of D then you are not able to see it. So, what is this antibody doing? What this antibody is doing is the antibody is blocking the interaction of the MHC with the T cell receptor. Again, an important concept that they, these are the reagents by which a lot of studies with uh, of uh, involving MHC were done. So that's why it's important for students to understand it. So let's go to the third experiment. Um, so this is um, um, a T cell clone with IA of D, and you've given it an APC of F. Now we had we had seen that previously, and you would obviously not get an interaction. 
Now, with the APC of D, you do get an interaction and that is actually the positive control in this um, experiment. Now, if you take these APCs and you transfect I A of D, which means you transfect I A um, alpha chain and I A beta chain and now you see that it is able to respond and you are it is able to respond because now the APC F is expressing the right MHC. So, um, what do these experiments prove? Uh, you know, first is that MHC is critical, and there is uh, um, the the T cell rec will recognize um, MHC molecules uh, because they are restricted by it, which means the T cell receptor uh, 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 recognizes only this particular um, uh, MHC molecule, and it will not recognize any other MHC molecule because that is how it has uh, it has been taught and uh, has been educated. Okay. Now, if what happens when a model antigen for example, I have given I put over here a chicken ovalbumin is injected into mouse, you first have the antigen uptake. So, it is injected uh, is ingested by antigen presenting cells, the ova peptides are the antigenic peptides are generated, these antigenic peptides need to bind MHC molecules within cells. Now, there are different processes that are involved over here, very important you have antigen uptake, okay. hmm. you have antigen processing where where from the antigen to, to antigenic peptides are generated and the third important point is antigen presentation where these antigenic peptides are presented on mhc molecules so very important um, parts for you all to remember that that you have these different processes and you should be able to distinguish the difference between antigen processing and antigen presentation they are not the same people often s use it in the same uh, uh, way but they are uh, they are there there are very distinct processes involved here Processing is the way by is the mechanisms by which peptides are generated. Presentation is the way by which peptides are presented on MHC molecules. Okay, so this is an important point that you all should remember. Okay, so we have one more experiment. Um, now, if you take antigen presenting cells and you fix them with glutaraldehyde. Now, what does glutaraldehyde do? Glutaraldehyde will cross-link all the cell surface proteins because that's what you have, is being done here, and then you put in T cells and then there is no antigen over here and you will not get a response. Now, however, if you take the APCs this is with D and you have given um, or put them with ovalbumin which is the antigen and you allow for processing for about 3 hours at about 37. Now, you fix the APCs plus glutaraldehyde uh, with, your t with your T cells you will get a response because these APCs there is sufficient time given for this for processing and uh, at the right temperature also because the cells need to be able to be viable and to be able to process it. The third important point and so th there is no sub big surprise over here uh, in the second part that the T cells are able to recognize it. The third important part is where you, you fix the AP, uh, uh, fix APCs with glutaraldehyde. Now, you add the ovalbumin peptides from outside and now you add your T cells again you will get a response. So, what is happening over here is the ova peptides will bind to MHC right from uh, the from the outside they may displace of some endogenous uh, bound, uh, bound uh, peptides. So, they will now bind to it and now this MHC peptide complex is recognized by your cognate T cells. Okay. So, over here what is shown over here T cells recognize H 2 O uh, of D which is the haplotype plus this particular um, uh, 6 mer uh, peptide uh, that is derived from uh, ovalbumin. So, what this tells you is, is uh, there are two aspects about antigen processing which are important. First is antigen processing is dependent upon time because if you do it quickly maybe not you know sufficient peptides will not be generated. Third is is dependent upon cellular metabolism. So, the cells have to be able to take it up and it takes uh, you know and process these they have to break it down and then generate this. So, the question is how are how are these generated? How are pepti uh, how are antigens taken up by cells and how are they broken down into peptides? What is the machinery that is involved in this and that is really the crux of this class. Okay, um, what are the evidences for the role of antigen presenting cells in T cell activation? So, these there are several uh, we will just uh, uh, we will just discuss a few. One is if you take radioactive or fluorescent uh, labeled antigens and you inject them into animals and was found that these are present mainly in phagocytes or dendritic cells, but not in lymphocytes. So, while lymphocytes are the effectors the actual processing is done by other types of cells and these are the antigen presenting cells. So, what are some of the antigen presenting cells? So, for example, you have uh, um, uh, Langerhans cells, you have dendritic cells, so, dendritic cells are the most physiological antigen presenting cells um, and uh, you have macrophages so on so forth. Okay. The second is 
Um, now, if you take an antigen and you inject it into mouse, okay, you get a poor T cell response. Um, now, but if you take um, antigens plus macrophages in vitro in culture and you inject it, you get a much better response. Okay, so that because antigens just by themselves are you get a good you get uh, you don't get a good response because um, you you are not able to generate it. What you would have to do over here is actually take the antigen and mix it with Freund's adjuvant or um, or some other adjuvant, and so that you, you are now able to generate a good, a uh, better uh, immune response. And there are some aspects of this that were covered in the part on on innate um, um, the immunity. What is also seen is the pure t, uh, t cells plus antigen. You get a poor T cell response because T cells by themselves are not good APCs. However, pure T cells plus APCs plus antigen you get a much better response that is because you have now the APCs that can process this antigen and present it to T cells. So, the role of APCs primarily is to digest antigens into peptides and B it has a accessory or, or co stimulatory functions which means you need to send a signal for T cell activation through the specific signal is through the MHC peptide, but you also need it has to be done in the proper context and for that you need uh, co stimulatory ligands to be upregulated which are recognized by co stimulatory receptors on T cells and you get a much better um, uh, uh, much better um, T cell response. Okay, so, now for the MHC class 1 um, we will start off with uh, 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 there are uh, basically 2 stories that I will I will uh, like to share with you. Um, the first is the RMA S story. Now, what was well, this was this happened several um, years back. RMA a, RMA is a cell line that expresses MHC class one, and this this uh, and uh, the 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 scientists who were doing this were trying to look at uh, the NK mediated uh, killing of uh, of this particular cell line, and so this cell line was mutagenized and it was selected uh, for uh, for um, a cell which is known as RMA S. Now, this RMAS expresses low levels of MHC class 1 and it cannot uh, uh, so as a as a consequence of that it is a poor um, antigen presenting cell compared to RMA. So, the wild type was RMA and the mutant uh, that was derived from RMA was RMAS. Now, the difference between the two is that RMAS is a poor antigen presenting cell RMA the parent is a good uh, antigen presenting cell and uh, why this is uh, needs to be figured out, but what was found is that uh, the MHC class 1 um, expression uh, on RMAS was low. Okay. So, one obvious response for being a poor antigen presenting cell is that the MHC class 1 response uh, MHC class 1 um, expression is low, but here is the interesting uh, part about it. Now, RMAS at 37 showed a poor class 1 response which is what I uh, um, uh, class 1 expression which is what I had said. Now, however, now if peptides were added, peptides that bound to MHC class 1, then you could increase the expression of cell surface MHC. So, this is telling you this is was what I had said that MHC molecules if they are empty that is without peptide, they are unstable, they get internalized uh, very quickly, they, they cannot uh, stay up on the cell surface because the conformation is affected, they are not stable. However, um, if you add peptide, then peptide increases the stability of MHC class 1 molecules increases there and increases the half life on the cell surface. But the uh, real interesting fact was that if these MHC class 1 molecules were, um, were or uh, if RMAS was uh, cultured at 22 degrees for some time, uh, you got very good cell surface expression. So, the, so, what this says is that there is no inherently there is no problem in MHC class 1 expression. Um, um, so, the MHC class 1 is expressed, but somehow at 37 there is a problem because at low temperature where uh, you do not need peptide um, for a very good uh, cell surface expression, the MHC class 1 uh, molecules come up on the surface and they are stable at low temperature. It is at 37 or the physiological temperature which is a problem. So, this is a very important point uh, that uh, I think students should be aware of. Um, so, this is the this is the main points that I had I had talked about. So, that MHC requires peptides for cell surface expression um, at the physiological temperature and the RMAS lies in the generation of MHC class 1 binding peptides because there is no, no inherent defect in MHC class 1. Because if there were an inherent defect then you would have the problem again at 22 degrees you do not see that at 22 degrees MHC uh, class 1 expression is fine it is only at 37. Um, and the fact that you can add peptides and stabilize MHC class 1 expression suggests um, that, uh, that the, the problem is really with the peptide, uh, peptide uh, binding to these MHC class 1 molecules. So, um, now here is the thing about MHC class 1 antigen uh, processing first is peptides need to be generated 
Okay. So, they need to be generated. So, the, the question is you know peptides need to be generated from antigen they need to become peptides. So, there has to be some machinery that is able to do this. The second important uh, fact is um, that uh, MNC molecules uh, they start off at the ER and then they travel to the cell surface by a process known as vesicular trafficking. So, the peptides if they are generated in the cytosol they need they need to be translocated into the ER and that is a very important point. So, the peptide generation is probably in the cytosol and then it needs to be translocated in the ER and that is where it might, might bind to MHC class 1 and then be trafficked uh, um, up to the cell surface. So, this is an important aspect that you need to keep in mind when you are undergoing when you are when you are reviewing this part of uh, the data. So, now we will go from here to another set of experiments. Uh, um, so, this is with uh, discovery of, uh, of, uh, pro of uh, proteasomes and the transporter associated with the antigen presentation. So, over here um, you know um, as I said uh, uh, that uh, there were there are ways of making allo MHC um, sera. So, um, so, if there are differences if you have two and this is the advantage of uh, congenic mice and this is um, this is the uh, and this is the contribution um, um, primarily um, of uh, the people in the Jackson lab who found out um, uh, of, of George Snell and all uh, who found out uh, um, the congenic mice. So, what happens over here is that you have two strains of mice they are genetically identical except for one loci and that loci is the MHC. So, if you take a BALB-C splenocytes which are H2D they are distinct from BALB-B only in the MHC complex. So, if you uh, so you would you would be able to generate an, an allocera against this and that allocera will recognize only MHC. So, that is what was done you have BALB-C splenocytes they were injected into BALB-B and you generated an allocera and you got um, H2 uh, um, this this anti H2D because the BALB-B generated a uh, antibodies that were different from BALB C and the only place where the differences were were, were over here. So, these were immunoprecipitated and you performed 2D uh, NEFKI page this this is long time back and NEFKI stands for non equilibrium pH gradient um, gel electrophoresis. So, what the way uh, what this does is that you have a ampholine gradient you separate your immunoprecipitated proteins based on PI. Or, or approximate PI and then you separate them based on, um, uh, on, on molecular weight. So, there are, there are two ways of separating one is the PI and the other is uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the molecular weight. So, this is different from IEFs because um, it is non equilibrium because you are not reaching the PIs of all proteins, but uh, the acidic proteins are, are primarily um, reached. Okay. So, what this done what this did was once it was uh, uh, once uh, um, this sort of experiments were done what was found is you had the MHC your typical MHC class 1 and class 2 uh, molecules were, uh, were, were found out, but much to the surprise what was found is that you had several low molecular mass pop peptides polypeptides being showing shown up. Now, the fact that you, you, you generated this response against um, uh, these this, this mouse and where the only difference was in the MHC suggested the allocera was recognizing something that was there in the MHC, uh, but was distinct or, or between BALB C and BALB B. Okay. Um, so, and two proteins uh, two small uh, or two low molecular uh, mass uh, peptides were identified this is LMP2 and LMP7 they are polymorphic they were linked to the MHC and the LMP complex as such was interferon gamma inducible. So, these are hallmarks of something to do with the MHC and it is clearly important because um, MHC plays such an important role. What was uh, interesting about this whole thing was that it turned out or, or, it, or, or it at least gave the appearance uh, at this point that they were not typical MHC class 1 or MHC class 2 there were some other proteins that were linked to the MHC they were interferon gamma inducible they were polymorphic suggestive of something important. Okay, so, further experiments were done um, to fine map it um, and uh, you, as I said um, what if you look at BAL B the haplotype that you get is this is BBB and this is this is the MHC class uh, MHC region. So, you have the K um, and then you have the MHC class uh, 2 region and then you have D and L which are the which is the MHC class 1 and you remember in mouse I had mentioned that the K is centromeric um, to the MHC class uh, 2 which is what is shown over here. Whereas, in BAL B you have all this is DDD. Now, if you have a recombinant between this part um, this region and this and you have another recombinant that is a recombinant between this and this you had these different lines that were recombinants you can actually map 
where the location is using this antisera because the antisera specifically recognize uh, the D and not the B uh, parts. So, using these sorts of experiments what was found is that, that uh, those polymorphic proteins were located between this region which is the K and the IA region. Um, so, um, so, they were centromeric to the MHC class 2 uh, region um, uh, and so, um, so, so the fine localization of these uh, uh, molecules were done. So, that was, uh, that was certainly very um, interesting um, and then, um, then uh, after the general gross localization the genes had to be found out and subsequently the molecular biology revolution took over you had cosmids they were digested with restriction enzymes northerns uh, were done um, with so to, to look for expression and then cdna libraries were screened and seven genes were identified so in a small uh, part seven uh, genes were uh, identified and all these uh, seven play an important role in mhc class 1 and class 2 antigen processing this is the important part because the presentation part were already uh, found out. So, LMP2 and LMP7 these are proteasome uh, subunits, um, um, uh, TAP1 and TAP2 this is a transporter associated with uh, antigen processing um, and we will be discussing more about these uh, uh, subsequently um, and you have the MA and MB genes which are involved in MHC class uh, 2 antigen uh, processing. So, this is the amazing part. So, you had this particular region between the K and the IA which encoded these seven genes and all the seven plays such important roles in antigen uh, MHC class 1 and class 2 antigen processing and presentation. Um, so, what are these uh, what, what are these proteins that are encoded by these genes? So, this is what I am saying um, you have uh, the K um, and uh, you have the IA part over here and these are where the genes are this is the DM and this is where the proteasome and the the TAP genes are and even in the human so it is in the MHC class 2 loci you have the this is between DP and the DQ you have these gene sets. So, it is very important that you uh, know so it is actually um, uh, in the MHC class 2 region and but uh, they are uh, encoding genes that are important in MHC class 1 antigen processing as well as um, MHC class 2 antigen processing. Okay, so, uh, uh, now I had said that there are two components which were uh, which were subunits of proteasomes. Now, what are proteasomes? So, these um, are the actually these are the enzymes that are primarily responsible for cleaving um, antigenic proteins and then um, churning out peptides. Um, so, this is the these are the, the we, we I, had, I had previously said that you need have you have antigen and then it needs to generate peptides right. So, the proteasomes are the ones that are responsible for them. Once these peptides are generated they need to be translocated into the ER and that is done by the transporter associated with the antigen processing that is the TAPs. So, you have two main components over here the proteasomes and the TAPs and right now we will study a little bit more about the proteasomes. So, they are um, cylindrical in shape uh, the molecular weight is about 700 um, kDa the sedimentation co coefficient is about 20 s. More importantly they consist of four rings each ring is made up of seven uh, subunits. So, you have um, the alpha subunits on the outside and the beta in the in the in the center I will be showing you pictures of uh, proteasomes. So, you will have a better idea. The alpha subunits are important in assembly whereas, the beta are important for catalysis and they are they are um, the it is a, it's a the catalytic threonine is the or the n terminal threonine is uh, really um, the important uh, residue uh, over here. Now, um, uh, and this is just a little bit of a uh, little bit to inform you about proteasomes. Um, proteasomes are present in thermoplasma which is an archibacteria, but you have a single alpha and a single beta subunit. But the quaternary structure of proteasomes is conserved right from archaea to mammals. So, even though there is a single subunit what is happening is you have seven subunits um, that, um, that make up the thermoplasma um, uh, uh, 20S proteasome. Um, so, you have the 7 alpha the 7 beta followed by the 7 beta and then the 7 alpha because the alpha are the two ends, but it is the same subunit over here. In rhodococcus uh, uh, you have two each um, in east you have seven diff distinct ones. So, the seven subunits are encoded by seven distinct genes 7 alpha and 7 beta. In mammals you have 7 alpha and 10 beta this is this was a surprise and this um, 10 can be divided up into 7 that are constitutive and 3 that are extra and uh, the these 3 um, are the interferon gamma inducible ones. 
So, in the 20S proteasome um, subunit composition there are three of them which are in interferon, indu uh, interferon gamma inducible. What is, uh, what is uh, interesting is two of those are MHC encoded which is LMP2 and LMP7. Okay. And uh, so, um, so why do you think that uh, these should be interferon gamma inducible and how would it uh, be important in, in making up the, uh, uh, the, um, the assembly um, and part of the uh, and, and, and the importance of it in MHC class 1 and gene processing. I think you should be thinking a little bit about this and also the fact that they are polymorphic may have uh, may give some clues. So, this is coming back to what I meant about the structure of the 20S proteasome. So, these are the 7 um, this is the dermoplasma one which has the same identical alpha subunits at the ends and the beta subunits. So, you can see that there are 7 um, um, alpha 7 betas over here. Um, if you just look at a glance you can see all the 3 proteasomes the quaternary structure is conserved right from archaea to the, ma the mammalian ones. Um, this is the east one which has 7 different um, uh, alpha subunits and the 7 different beta. Um, and if you see uh, the you know the, the way the, the subunits are oriented they are slightly off uh, each other. Um, so, there is a slight uh, difference uh, in there and this is the, um, the mammalian 20S proteasomes they are also um, they are also different, but what was shown is that the 3 for the 3 interferon gamma inducible ones you have 3 constitutive um, uh, ones. So, so it is the subunits can go in only and take in um, only uh, replace a particular constitutive subunit. So, they cannot just move in and replace any uh, and, and get incorporated in any place they can be incorporated only at a particular place. So, that is an important aspect. This is a rather busy slide, but you know proteasomes are present in large amounts they are important for protein degradation, protein homeostasis um, um, and I will also show the that uh, proteasomes are part of the machinery which is known as the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So, uh, pro, uh, so proteins that are destined for degradation they get ubiquitinated so that is a tag that is put on these ubiquitinated proteins are recognized by um, proteasome complexes um, by 26S proteasome complexes and these are degraded into peptides. So, you have amino acids that are recycled it is a way by which protein homeostasis takes place older proteins get uh, turned over um, so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, and so, what the immune system has done has it has taken an existing pathway and incorporated it for its own needs. So, that uh, so it, you know it has not come up with the original um, uh, pathway to, to, to uh, develop uh, uh, peptides um, and uh, it has come up with a pre-existing pathway uh, that, um, that uh, evolutionary pathway that is used for um, protein homeostasis. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so, what are the, uh, but uh, since this class is mainly on MHC uh, we will be restricting um, uh, our uh, understanding of proteasomes to the immune response. Um, so, if you take uh, uh, model proteins after modification and give them to 20S proteasome they generate the exact epitopes that bind MHC class 1. Um, and the digestion products of proteasomes are 8 to 12 uh, amino acids which is similar to MHC class 1 antigen uh, peptides. So, uh, this is important now pro what proteasomes do is they do not chew up uh, the peptides into single amino acids. Um, so, they generate peptides and um, if these peptides are able to bind MHC class 1 uh, molecules then they are stabilized. Um, however, if, if they do not bind then these uh, smaller peptides are degraded by aminopeptidases and carboxypeptidases within the cell. So, after these peptides are generated if they bind MHC class 1 only then they are stabilized. Um, now, proteasome specific inhibitors block MHC class 1 and they will block MHC class 1 uh, because uh, um, um, the MHC molecules need peptide binding after they bind to the peptide their, their, their structure is, uh, um, is, is, is made more stable and it can now aggress. So, in the absence of, uh, um, of, uh, of, uh, of peptides MHC molecules are unstable and they sort of uh, tend to uh, remain in the ER Golgi. Um, and um, subsequently uh, specific um, knockout mice were generated. So, you have the LMP2 knockout mice and these express low um, these express low uh, CD8. So, low CD8 would mean that uh, there is some problem with selection with MHC class 1 and uh, the MHC, um, uh, MHC 7 knockout uh, you have uh, low MHC class 1 cell surface expression. Now, um, what is important over here these mice are available and the interferon uh, gamma inducible proteasome subunits uh, um, are, um, uh, are, are not essential 
uh, they are not essential because you have constituted subunits. What these interferon gamma inducible subunits do is, you know, when an immune reaction is taking place, uh, you have more of these subunits, and so then uh, by law of mass action, you have more of these. So the chances that they get incorporated into proteasomes as they are being assembled are higher. So uh, one needs to understand uh, uh, that aspect. Okay, so what are the substrates uh, proteins for proteasomal degradation? The first is, as I mentioned, ubiquitinated proteins. That's part of the normal pathway. So, as um, for the what the cell biology uh, method um, is, is if you want to target proteins for degradation, um, uh, you um, the proteins often get ubiquitinated. The other is while proteins are being translated, you have these products known as the, the, those uh, proteins that are not properly formed and those are defective ribosomal uh, products or DRIPS um, uh, and, and DRIPS DRIPS. These are, uh, um, these are, uh, um, are destined for uh, degradation and again the proteasomes play an important role in this. So, what often happens is the MHC molecules end up um, showing peptides that, uh, um, that arise from DRIPS. So, again an important point. Now, um, now you have proteasomes which I showed you um, were consist of uh, the four uh, rings. Um, now, this uh, proteasomes are, are regulated by other molecules. So, you have the PA28, uh, um, now what uh, these are the activators, what PA28 uh, alpha and beta um, uh, uh, does is that it increases proteasome activity. Um, and uh, so, as a consequence, the you know proteasomes will will cleave uh, uh, peptides uh, or will will cleave proteins lot faster. Um, the other more imp uh, physiologically important one uh, is the ubiquitination process, and the 20s prote um, uh, proteasomes bind to 19s regulators. Now, these 19s regulators consist of ATPases, um, uh, ubiquitin binding proteins, to form 26s complexes. And is the 26S complexes which are responsible for majority of the non-lysosomal degradation of proteins. So the important uh, point for students is that the immune system has recruited an evolutionary conserved pathway of protein degradation to generate MHC class one peptides. So this is an important part. They have they have made some changes in it. They have they have some genes that are involved, um, newer subunits that have evolved along um, uh, with this. But otherwise, they have used a common pathway. Okay, that's an important part. Point. So, uh, so this is what is uh, shown over here. There are two parts. You have protein ubiquitination; they are targeted for degradation, and 26S proteasomes uh, degrade proteins to 8 to 6. Now, if only these peptides bind to MHC, then they become stable. Because what peptide binding to MHC does is rescues it from uh, from from degradation. Uh, the other way, as I mentioned, was that the drips, uh, uh, the defective ribosomal uh, products, uh, um, and so these are further cleaved. Um, uh, by uh, by exopeptidases and all, and then they are um, put up on. Uh, um, uh, uh, they are they are shown up on. Uh, uh, they bind to uh, uh, MHC molecules. PA28, as I said, uh, is um, uh, is a regulator. It increases the activity of proteasome, so the cleavage is a lot faster. Um, so, this is PA700 um, which is the 19S regulator. Now, what um, it is it's important to understand that because what once the 19S regulators bind it forms a 26S uh, complex um, and what it does it, it opens up the channel binding of the 19S regulators to the 20S complexes opens up the channels so that uh, which is normally gated. So, now you so that you can have now um, uh, proteins um, that uh, enter into the proteasomes and remember these uh, proteins need to be um, uh, cannot be folded. So, they need to be um, they need to be unfolded and unfolding requires ATP and then it, it enters the proteasome from where they are cleaved. Um, and uh, so, this uh, uh, so, this is an important uh, aspect and uh, the unfolding of proteins re require ATP. Also, the ubiquitination process by which uh, you know proteins get tagged on um, um, to ubiquitin needs ATP. So, this process needs ATP per se peptide uh, or uh, peptide generation that is uh, the breakdown of, uh, from of, uh, of proteins into uh, peptides um, does not need ATP. Um, for example, trypsin will cleave without ATP. Uh, but however, because of the unfolding process that is involved and the ubiquitination process, those need ATP and therefore, it is an ATP dependent process. So, this is a cartoon just to show this is the 20S uh, proteasome was mentioned and this is the, the, the 19S base 
um, and this is the lid and you have this in the presence of ATP you have the 26S uh, proteasome and it is the 26S proteasome which is re responsible for the um, ATP and ubiquitin dependent degradation of uh, proteins. Okay, so, this is uh, what is shown with respect to ubiquitination. Um, you have ubiquitin which gets uh, um, which gets linked up with different enzymes the E1, E2, E3. Ultimately you have this is the particular protein substrate which is misfolded or phosphorylated which needs to be targeted and so this gets ubiquitinated and this is shown over here it gets poly uh, ubiquitinated. This poly ubiquitinated protein is recognized by uh, the 19S and it is um, it's unfolded and then the proteasome then cleaves it into peptides. And these peptides can either bind to MHC class 1 molecules or they can be degraded by amino peptidases and carboxypeptidases into amino acids and that can be recycled back uh, for uh, protein synthesis. Uh, this is uh, more of uh, more of uh, more of that um, a different cartoon again to show proteasome assembly you have uh, the alpha subunits and you have the beta subunits they come together to give to form the 20S proteasome. This 20S proteasome can now bind to the regulators known as the PA28 and uh, so once uh, these bind to it you will have generation of more peptides because what PA28 does it is a positive regulator of uh, proteasome activity. And then this is the other one which is more important which is uh, the 19S regulators. What 19S regulators do it is to bind the, the poly ubiquitinated proteins and those poly ubiquitinated proteins are um, are, um, are unfolded, ubiquitin is removed from them, they are passed on to proteasomes and they are now these proteins are now degraded uh, into peptides. So, this part refers to the generation of peptides for MHC class 1 antigen processing. So, now students should be familiar with the way an antigen is taken up and how it is broken down into peptides and some of these peptides can bind MHC class 1 molecules. Okay, so, once peptides are generated they need uh, they need uh, to be translocated from the cytosol into the ER because the MHC class 1 molecules are present in the ER. And so, this is done by uh, members of the ABC family or um, the ATP binding cassette family and um, there um, are um, um, so, they are about 70 KDA protein and these are essential for MHC class 1 antigen processing. So, if there are peptides that are generated, but the peptides cannot uh, be translocated into uh, the ER, uh, then you will have uh, then they will not be able to bind to MHC class 1 molecules and uh, they will be they will be stuck over there. So, they are absolutely essential that peptides that are generated are translocated into um, the lumen of the um, ER where um, it binds to MHC class 1 molecules. <coughs> Now, both uh, uh, TAP1 and TAP2 are required for peptide binding and translocation and uh, what is shown is uh, the N terminal domain is required for binding to tapacin uh, which is a sort of a linker molecule between the TAP and the MHC class 1 uh, molecules and part of the larger um, complex of proteins known as the peptide loading complex. Um, the, um, uh, the cytosolic the nuclear um, uh, nucleotide uh, binding domain containing um, the Walker uh, boxes are involved in ATP hydrolysis. Now, for peptide translocation um, you need ATP um, and that is why you need the Walker boxes that uh, are an important part of this. Okay, and so, this is a cartoon um, to show uh, how uh, this is all done. Um, so, let us say this is a particular protein. Um, and you can see this particular protein it is de degraded by proteasomes to generate the peptides. Um, now, obviously, uh, students need to understand this is not done to scale. Um, the, the peptides are then translocated from the cytosol, um, they uh, go through the taps okay, uh, transporter associated and uh, over here uh, they undergo some trimming also uh, by some other molecules. Um, uh, by some other peptidases the ER specific peptidases that are present um, and then uh, and, and bind on to MHC class 1 molecules. Okay. And then these are uh, then um, uh, MHC class 1 molecules then aggress um, the ER Golgi and then they move on to the cell surface. Now, here it is at the cell surface what is shown over here. Now, the MHC class 1 molecules have peptide on them and they are free to present peptides to uh, the cytotoxic T cells uh, or uh, CTLs um, as, as shown over here. And uh, again the recognition that is shown is you have the T cell uh, receptor complex binding to MHC peptide. So, this has an overview of uh, the pathway by which uh, MHC class 1 uh, molecules um, um, uh, the MHC class 1 pathway works. First is 
the proteins need to be generated into peptides, the peptides in the cytosol need to be translocated via taps. So, proteasomes are important, transporters are important. Over here there is trimming involved by ER specific um, amino peptidases uh, known as ERAP and then uh, you have the peptide binding to MHC class 1 and then um, the MHC class 1 molecules then egress and travel to the cell surface. It is at the cell surface that you have uh, the MHC molecules that can uh, present uh, that, that show these peptides uh, to, uh, to T cells and you can get uh, um, uh, a T cell activation pathway in being initiated. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> yeah, um, so, let us go over the model for MHC class 1 uh, processing vesicular trafficking. So, how, what do we defin define by vesicles? So, MHC molecules are present um, in ER and they, they travel from the ER Golgi to the cell surface as part of vesicles, right. So, that is the vesicular pathway that we are talking about. The key molecules involved are heavy chain beta 2 microglobulin because those two are form the MHC um, class 1 molecules. You have transporter associated with antigen processing and you have tapasin. Tapasin is the linker molecule, um, it is a 48 kDa linker molecule. And again what is interesting is the location of tapasin is that it is centromeric to the K region in uh, to the uh, H2K uh, in the um, um, uh, um, uh, in the uh, in the uh, MHC. Uh, so, centromeric means it is further um, it is away from the MHC and uh, it is uh, it is on the other side. Um, so, tapasin binds to MHC uh, class 1 uh, heavy chain and TAP. So, that is that is why I said it is a linker and it binds to um, TAP via the transmembrane domain um, and MHC via the uh, ER uh, uh, luminal uh, domain. It retains MHC class 1 um, in uh, the ER until optimal peptides uh, are bound. Um, uh, tapasin enhances the steady state amounts of, uh, of TAP. So, the TAP uh, amounts are increased uh, in the presence of uh, tapasin. Um, um, and uh, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is shown is that uh, tapasin um, is sort of similar to MHC class 1, but it, it cannot uh, bind to peptides. Um, um, H2DM is also somewhat uh, uh, similar to uh, the MHC uh, uh, class uh, 2 molecules, but again it uh, cannot function as MHC class 2. Hmm. So, this is the basic model of, uh, of MHC class 1. So, you have first the peptide generation and the peptide translocation. Um, uh, peptides need to be generated, they are generated by proteasomes, peptide translocation, they are generated by uh, TAPS, uh, trans, um, uh, transporter associated with antigen processing. Then peptide binding to MHC class 1. Um, and then you have trafficking to the cell surface. Um, so, this that is uh, again um, sort of shown here you have an intracellular antigen it gets uh, um, it gets cleaved by proteasomes you have peptides being generated. So, they uh, um, um, uh, they, they enter uh, these peptides are translocated into the ER Golgi um, and then you have the MHC class 1 molecules these end up uh, by vesicular trafficking on the cell surface and now you have MHC on the cell surface. Okay. So, now this is some parts that uh, I would like to uh, like you to think about um, and uh, discuss. What are the possible consequences uh, of the role of polymorphisms in the MHC heavy chain TAP, LMP2 and LMP7? Now, um, what, what was shown or what was discussed is that uh, the MHC heavy chain is highly polymorphic. Okay. Um, in mouse and humans, the TAP and the proteasomal subunits are not that polymorphic. Okay. There are some polymorphisms, known, but they are not incredibly polymorphic the way MHC uh, heavy chain is. Um, but how would the polymorphisms in the TAP um, and the proteasome subunits uh, affect uh, our ability to respond to um, um, during an immune response? Um, if you just think about it, um, MHC molecules will bind to peptides, different kinds of peptides and their ability to bind to different uh, different peptides is because of uh, um, of the uh, of the uh, because of the polymorphisms that are present in the MHC. So, and the these different polymorphisms give it uh, the ability to bind to different types of, of peptides. Now, if you have some polymorphisms in the TAP and in the proteasome subunits, how would that affect? 
So, first is polymorphisms in the proteasome subunit might, uh, might result in alterations in the kinds of peptides that are being generated. So, now in a cell if you have polymorphic uh, um, uh, 20, um, uh, 20 S proteasome uh, molecules, you have different types of peptides being generated. Right? Um, so, so, that allows uh, for that. Um, so, you have different types of peptides and now if you have TAP being polymorphic too, you, um, so the different polymorphisms may allow for different set of peptides being to be translocated. So, some TAP molecules with a particular polymorphism may not allow some peptides to be translocated whereas, others may allow it. So, this allows for it and then finally, you have different MHC molecules where, where which has the capacity to bind to different uh, uh, different uh, peptides that are generated based on what is what type of peptides are generated and what type of uh, peptides are translocated. Remember antigenic proteins need to be degraded first and so proteasomes play an important role over there. Subsequently, they need to be um, uh, they need to be translocated. So, if, if peptides are not generated or are being generated, the peptides are not being translocated or are being translocated, they will finally affect the ability of the different types of peptides to bind to MHC molecules and that is something that uh, you should be um, um, certainly aware of. Now, um, and obviously, this would affect our ability to respond um, to different scenarios. So, that is why you have some people who are highly susceptible to certain um, organisms where others are not that susceptible. Perhaps you know the different polymorphisms allow us uh, with uh, this, uh, this huge variance in our, uh, in our responses. Um, so, uh, that is that's one uh, a very important aspect that sh students should be thinking about. Okay. The second is, um, um, is uh, uh, is uh, the fact that uh, um, um, the MHC molecules um, are um, there is a difference between um, the trafficking of human uh, MHC molecules and uh, mouse MHC molecules. By and large, uh, mouse MHC molecules, um, even if they do not have peptide bound to MHC molecules. Uh, they will traffic to the cell surface. They will traffic, but they will be unstable and they will be quickly internalized and that is why in uh, mutants of TAP, you have low cell surface uh, expression, but not uh, it is not uh, absolutely uh, um, uh, uh, absolutely absent. Uh, so, you have low because uh, the MHC molecules aggress to the cell surface are internalized um, uh, rapidly because they are unstable, um, but they will go there. Um, by and large human MHC molecules are somewhat different in that, um, that uh, in the absence of uh, proper uh, um, uh, peptides, uh, they, will, they will be stuck in the ER Golgi and they will not even go over there by and large. And since again both human and mouse uh, uh, molecules are both polymogenic and polymorphic, you have differences, but what I am saying is by and large uh, a scenario. Um, so, now you can see that there are, there are obviously apart from TAP, apart from, um, um, from, uh, from uh, proteasomes, um, you have other players in this and especially in the peptide loading complex and that is and some of the other players uh, like calnexin, calreticulin are ones that I will talk about a little bit in the next class. Uh, but certainly, you should be uh, somewhat aware of this, this broad generalization by which um, MHC molecules, the mouse MHC molecules will aggress to the cell surface uh, even the absence of peptides and but they will be unstable because uh, um, and that leads to low cell surface expression. The human ones you would not even aggress there because they become they be stuck in the absence of it uh, uh, by and large HLA molecules will not will not go up. Uh, what you should do um, is to compare the localization of uh, the HLA and the H2 um, and look at the different genes in the MHC a little bit more closely and then try and see where the, the, the TAPs, the DMs and uh, um, the proteasome uh, subunit genes are localized um, in um, the human versus uh, the mouse uh, MHC. Also, look at the, the, the differences in structure, uh, difference in genetic uh, um, uh, organization of these two, um, and I think that will be something very useful. But most importantly, what uh, you should be uh, thinking about is the way we have evolved. Um, so, that you have um, at least human and mice where you have primarily you have differences in the MHC molecules and um, um, you have polymorphic MHC molecules so that they can bind different types of peptides. Now, apart from this you have also polymorphisms 
in both in um, the proteasome subunits and as well as in the translocate in the in the trans in the taps. So, you can see uh, variations uh, of these molecules um, you can um, understand the role of these variations these genetic variations which will affect uh, function of these different proteins and it will affect function in the sense that certain peptides may be generated or may not be generated and if these are generated they may be translocated or not be translocated. So, you can see ultimate peptide binding to MHC molecules is a consequence of different processes. First is antigen uh, present uh, and antigen processing by which they are broken down into peptides then translocation and then final binding. Remember all the peptides that are generated or all the peptides that are translocated may not bind because and because again once peptide binds some may be very low affinity peptides which will uh, which will uh, be uh, competed out by the higher affinity peptides. So, ultimate uh, you know uh, binding will depend on also the binding of the MHC binding group with the particular peptide. So, you have different processes over here ultimately the highest uh, or the ones with the uh, the greatest affinity will bind to MHC molecules will go to the cell surface and be presented and what over there we will need to have some sort of T cells that can recognize this and peruse it and if you are able to have a particular uh, a, a T cell specific for this and especially if the peptide comes from a pathogen you will be able to generate a, a, a T cell um, activation and generate a T cell response. So, I hope uh, this class uh, has given students an idea about the MHC class 1 pathway. Uh, of uh, antigen processing and then ultimately presentation and processing involves proteasomes where uh, generation of peptides take place, the transporter associated with antigen processing and presentation where translocation takes place and final binding uh, of the peptides um, uh, with the MHC molecules. So, thank you.